Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, Persona, Xenoblade, or even Kingdom Hearts. These games are beloved for their art styles, their storytelling, and the journey they take you on. From the humble beginnings of the characters, you will watch them grow in strength from barely being able to stay alive to being able to slay literal gods. You'll watch as they make new friends, suffer betrayals, loss, and setbacks at almost every turn, and yet come out the other side stronger than before, filled with a determination to push onwards. So what happens when a game manages to get almost every aspect of the genre completely and utterly wrong? My name is Groudon, and I'm reviewing Steam games in alphabetical order to uncover hidden gems. Last episode was number 25, which means the background video is due an upgrade. Nice! I'm looking forward to when they're so small you can barely see them. Now, let's get into today's game, Arcane Rays, and see if it's a diamond in the rough, or just plain garbage. They say that first impressions are everything, and in the world of video games, this absolutely holds true. Thanks to Steam achievements, we know that many games can lose anywhere between 10 and 25% of their players before they even finish the tutorial. Want some proof? In Dark Souls 1, only 72% of players have lit the first bonfire. That's before you face off against the first mini-boss, the Asylum Demon. Fallout 4, only 83% of players leave the vault and enter the wasteland. In Terraria, only 86.5% of players chop down a tree. So, when you load up a game and it looks like this, well, you're not really off to a great start. To make matters worse, there isn't even a settings menu. Not yet, anyway. Starting the game throws you straight into the tutorial. No intro sequence, no lore dump, nothing. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, it gets right into the gameplay. There's a short explanation of the controls, including the option to completely skip it, which suggests that you may replay the game at some point. As we'll discover later, this is a laughable idea. It also mentions how to open the settings menu in order to enable full screen mode, turn music and sound effects on or off, as well as customise keybinds. I noticed at this point that it has controller keybinds, so when I restarted the game to enable the full screen mode, I also plugged in my trusty PS4 controller to see if it works, and I was pleasantly surprised to find that it does. This is probably the only thing the game does right. So, on to the tutorial. It takes place in what appears to be an alternate dimension, separate from the world of the main game, and is definitely not linked to anything else. It's very much a tutorial that is designed purely to be a tutorial, not a prologue that functions as a tutorial. The area is divided into zones that each teach you about a different mechanic, how to interact with people, how to interact with objects and equip items, basic combat, modes of transport such as teleporters and ships, and the random battle and counter system. These are all perfectly serviceable and give you a chance to get acquainted with the core systems. During the tutorial, you play as Captain Angelo, starting at level 40. Looking at the status screen, there's a brief bio that describes him as a crestfallen warrior with no legion left to command. Now, if you're thinking, oh, that sounds interesting, maybe we're going to go back in time to find out what happened to this man, what tragedy befell him and his friends. Maybe we'll meet him in the main game and he'll become a party member. That's what a good JRPG would do, right? Well, after finishing the final tutorial area, you're instructed to step into the portal to proceed. When you do, Captain Angelo is immediately replaced by a party of three random characters with hair colours that exude main character energy. Poor Captain Angelo is never seen or heard from ever again. Compared to these three, he's just an NPC, which I find hilarious as all three of the main characters, Sanctus, Umbra and Anima, all have the exact same bio line, a nameless shade. But maybe this will update as the game progresses and the characters make names for themselves in the wider world. Again, you're expecting this game to be good? Stop that. The bio line stays the same for the entire game, even after defeating the final boss. This means the character you play as for less than 5% of the game has more backstory than the three protagonists you're forced to play as. Also, they aren't even nameless, their name is literally right there. 
Anyway, we have appeared on a bridge and we're immediately asked if we want to move through the passage to the right to unlock all of the achievements or if we want to skip them. And I have so many problems with this. Firstly, what is the point of achievements in your game if you're just going to give them away like this? Achievements are meant to be given for, you know, achieving something. Secondly, why now after the tutorial? I'd be slightly more okay with this if you gave me all the achievements after beating the game, rather than before I've even started. Thirdly, how condescending is it that the game feels the need to tell me to walk to the right? It's a bridge, and I'm on the left hand side. Right is the only way I can go. With how much hand holding it's been doing so far, I doubt it'll just let me jump off the darn thing. Although that would actually make me like the game more. Never thought I'd want to give a game bonus points for letting me throw myself off a bridge. That's new. And lastly, why is it that only 7.4% of players have these achievements? Did everyone else just skip the tutorial? Or do people get to this menu and think, nah, I'm good. You can keep those achievements to yourself, game. I don't need the extra pat on the back. <sighs> so. Feeling thoroughly confused and somewhat belittled, I choose to walk over the bridge and accept the achievements. After doing so, we find ourselves in the main hub town of the game, Unia. Well, I say main hub town, but it's actually the only hub town. Here you have access to an inn with four shops in the basement, four portals that take you to progressively more difficult dungeons, and in a touch that I kind of respect, the actual final boss that the game will let you challenge at any time. So other than the dungeons, there is no exploration to be found here. Guess we can cross that one off the JRPG checklist. And while we're at it, we can also cross off the story, as the only explanation about anything that we get is from the town guide, who tells us that we are in Unia, a sanctuary for lost souls. We are shades trying to get strong enough to return to the real world, and that we must become stronger to do so. That is it. And this person, who is never named, is literally the only person in the game you can speak to that isn't a shopkeeper. You'll never get any information about the backstory of the protagonist, they never speak to each other either, and you're never told what is happening in the real world and why you need to get there, or where you came from. All three characters are blank slates, with no motivations of their own, no goals, and ultimately, no reason to do anything. Heading into the inn, you've got beds to rest in which recover your HP and MP, and four shops. An armour shop, a weapon shop, an item shop, and a magic shop. The first three are pretty standard fare, but more on that last one, the magic shop, later, as we'll discover that it's actually the most overpowered shop in the game. Luckily, we start off with a decent bit of cash, so knowing that the best defense is a good offense, I head into the weapon shop to get geared up. The three protagonists each have a unique preset class which dictates what weapons and armor they can use, as well as what abilities they will learn. Sanctus is a paladin and gets the best defense and HP, is able to use shields, and learns holy magic, including healing spells. Umbra is a spell sword, making him the melee fighter of the group. He's the fastest and does the most physical damage, but has less health and defense than Sanctus. He's able to learn magic that enhances his attacks with elemental damage, but not much else. Anima is a witch, and she specializes in dealing magical damage and debuffs. Looking at the weapon shop, I notice that it sells what appears to be every tier of equipment from the very basic starter gear to the powerful end game gear. Given that this is the only shop we'll ever access, this makes some amount of sense, but I thought the shop would gain new equipment after beating each dungeon, allowing for balanced progression and preventing the player from becoming too overpowered. That's foreshadowing, by the way. I pick out my starter weapons. Axes and katanas do more damage than swords, so I get one of each for Sanctus and Umbra respectively. And given that Anima is a magical type class, I equip her with a stereotypical mage weapon. A gun. Screw the normal conventions, if you let me equip my mage with a gun, why would I equip anything else? In so many games, magical damage dealing classes are stuck with rubbish wooden sticks that barely do any damage, so unless they are expending their precious limited MP, they are basically useless until a boss fight starts. With a gun, Anima will always be useful, even when she's out of MP. So. Weapons equipped, I buy some basic armor and healing items with my remaining cash, and prepare to head into the first dungeon. Oh, by the way, gold in this game is called Aurum, or AU for short, which, you know, just happens to be the chemical symbol for gold. Someone probably gave themselves a big old pat on the back for thinking of that one. 
can't call it gold. No, no, no. That's a typical fantasy JRPG trope, and we can't have that. They say as they fulfill almost every other typical fantasy JRPG trope. As a heads up to any aspiring devs watching, this doesn't make you or your game look cool or unique. It makes you pretentious. There is nothing wrong with using gold as your currency. It's familiar and easily understandable, so you won't alienate your players. <sighs> oh dear. We're barely into this game, and I've already gone off on two rants. Well, on the bright side, there actually isn't much more to say about the game. The four dungeons are extremely basic and repetitive. Inside each dungeon, you'll find yourself exploring, fighting enemies in random encounters, and opening treasure chests. And if you were hoping to find some unique items while exploring, too bad. Loot in the chest consists of either a bunch of assorted healing items, or an unbalanced amount of cash. How unbalanced? Well, basic starter gear costs 100 orum per item. The second level costs around 500, and each chest you open gives exactly 1875 orum. Never more, never less. But this means that after opening a single chest, you can purchase a second tier weapon for all three characters. In most cases, that would double the damage output. So by the end of the first dungeon, I was able to purchase the highest level katana for Umbra. Now, there is no level or stat requirement to equip gear, so Umbra went from having to work with the party to bring down a basic enemy, to being able to one-shot everything. And if that's not broken, I don't know what is. The first dungeon, the forest, is a maze-like expanse filled with dead ends and these lovely, white, untextured teleportation tiles. Make your way through to the end and you'll find absolutely nothing. No mini-boss, no plot development, no staircase to the next floor. Nothing. And each of the four dungeons works in exactly the same way. They serve only as a singular map to explore, to provide cash for upgrades and random encounter fights for experience points. After the forest is a poison swamp. This level is the most unique of all four as it has the mechanic of the poison swamp tiles damaging your party as you walk over them. Now, it might make this area the most unique, but it certainly doesn't make it fun. After the second time you have to open the menu and heal your entire party, the tedium sets in. And it's made worse by the fact that traversing the poison isn't optional, it's necessary in order to explore. If the game were giving me a choice of a faster path or extra loot with a trade-off of damaging the party, compared to a longer path that results in more random encounters, then I'd be okay with this. As it stands, this is just awful. The third area is entered through what appears to be a snow-covered portal, which leads you to, you guessed it, a jungle. Yeah, the, the visuals of the portals don't match the areas at all. In fact, the final, plain-looking portal leads to a fiery hellscape. This leads me to believe that the devs were using pre-made assets rather than creating anything of their own, so just used whatever they had available. So, after working through all four zones and opening every chest I could find, I've managed to equip my party with the best weapons and armor available. With a large amount of Aurum left over, I decide to check the fourth shop, the Magic Item Shop. And this is where all balance completely breaks. This shop sells items that permanently boost stats for 200 Aurum each. And even after buying the best possible gear, I have around 80,000 Aurum left over. And that means I can buy about 400 items, and each item boosts a stat by 3 points. Yeah, the balance has just been completely thrown out the window now. After spending all my money, the stats of my characters have basically doubled. So, I head back to the fourth dungeon and slaughter the monsters that were previously tough, but now can just be slapped away like an annoying fly, and manage to grind out another 100,000 Aurum, and do it again. Now sufficiently boosted, I decide that it's time to take on the final boss. After approaching the imposing armoured figure that stands near the portals, I speak to it, and it immediately transforms into a chimera. I don't think this is meant to happen, considering that the portrait appears to be a nightmarish vampire. And especially considering that we are immediately thrown into a fight with, in typical JRPG fashion, a literal demon god that attacks you with nukes. The escalation in JRPGs is usually quite extreme, but this is frankly ridiculous. 
A few minutes ago we were fighting vampires and trolls and now we're fighting a demon god. Whatever, let's just get it over with. The boss will silence and confuse the party to hamstring you as much as possible, but by using overpowered potions that fully restore HP and stupidly powerful basic attacks, the demon god goes down pretty easily, like less than five minutes. After beating it, we're returned to Unia and congratulated on proving our strength and becoming a Shade Alpha, whatever that is. And then, nothing happens. I wander for a bit and check the town's only NPC to see if they say anything different, but no, still the same dialogue. I check the status screen to see if the bio has changed, but no, that's still the same too. I go into the inn and chat to the innkeeper, nothing different there either. I exit and check outside, maybe there's a new portal to a final area where we have to defeat the angel god. Nothing. But the final boss, the demon god, has reappeared. Maybe they have something new to say. No, it just triggers the same fight, which is even easier now that we've leveled up from beating it last time. And that's when I realise, this game has no ending. There's no final cutscene, no thank you for playing, or end screen, no credits roll. Our party of three heroes are stuck in this limbo forever, there is no escape. And as a final point, I'd like to draw your mind back to the tutorial. Remember that boat? Yeah, that's not in the actual game. Unlike the heroes of Arcane Rays, I am able to escape the game. But what I can't escape is the memory that this game has burned into my mind for eternity. And this is surprisingly fitting because I want to share with you how the game describes itself on the Steam store page. Are you looking for a very special experience, one that you will always remember? Look no further than Arcane Rays series. This is a very special gem. Arcane Rays is a hardcore role-playing video game created through passion, dedication and labour of love. Guaranteed be a game you will always remember for better or worse, it will be ingrained in your memory forever and ever. This likely isn't quite what the devs meant when they wrote that, but it's the result they get for heaping praise on themselves, for insinuating that this game will single-handedly revolutionise the JRPG genre, when in reality they have created a bare-bones mockery of a JRPG. In fact, they mentioned the Arcane Rays series, which I'm delighted to report, doesn't exist. Arcane Rays released in 2017 and is yet to have a sequel, and I for one hope it stays that way. However, while it may not have a sequel, what it does have is DLC. This DLC consists of three alternative characters to play as that start at level 5 and come with weapons, armour and a stack of Aurum, essentially boosting you through the already easy early game. To make matters worse, these three characters fail to introduce any kind of new plot or character interactions and are the exact same three classes as the original three. So for $4.49 per character, you can play as some differently coloured pixels. These aren't new characters, they are basically just reskins of the basic ones. Another DLC skips the character nonsense entirely and simply offers you gold and experience for a little over a dollar. And the final DLC, which is thankfully free, is a three page PDF of the lore of Arcane Rays. Lore that seems to be either unrelated or loosely tied to the actual game. I had a look. It's filled with awful prose and frankly sexist ideas and concepts that conflict with the final game. For example, it mentions that shades travel in pairs, yet we play as a group of three in the game. Does this mean we're somehow special? We'll never know. It also mentions that the pair consists of one male and one female shade, and that the female shade never speaks. Wow. Just... Wow. Is anyone else picturing a fedora-wearing, katana-wielding neckbeard as the author of this? Just me? Well, all of these things form the final nails in the coffin where Arcane Rays belongs. Arcane Rays claims to redefine the meaning of the word JRPG, a terrible sentence in itself, but manages to somehow take the genre backwards, even compared to the granddad of all JRPGs, Final Fantasy 1. Released way back in 1987, Final Fantasy 1 manages to have many features that Arcane Rays lacks. An explorable overworld, different modes of transport, a customizable party of four, an actual plot, and balanced progression. 
30 years later, 30 years of incremental improvements, and you're trying to tell me that Arcane Rays is somehow the pinnacle of the genre? This game isn't worth your time, let alone your money, which is why my final rating is... Escape out of 10. Some games you should just run away from. Thanks for watching. Oh hey, you're still here? Firstly, thank you for watching and supporting this extremely silly gaming journey that I'm on. Secondly, while you're waiting for the video to end, why not take a moment to like the video and make sure you're subscribed for future ones. If you're feeling adventurous, you could also leave a comment and say hi, I try to respond to everyone. I aim to release new videos every Saturday, depending on the length of the game that I'm struggling my way through. So until the next one, take care.